So good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to the organizers for um, organizing this beautiful conference. For all the organizers here, right, local and, and non-local. Um, today is already my last day, so if you should have any questions, please come to me after the talk. Uh, so I'll be uh, leaving tomorrow, and I really enjoyed my time here. It was brilliant. I had so many good discussions and learned so many new things and really enjoyed the talk. So thanks also to the other speakers. Okay, so I had a bad night. I compensated with co coffee. I hope I'm as semi-coherent as my two groups that will appear later on. So uh, please bear with me if it's not quite as good. Okay, I should start saying that um, this is all what I'm presenting is joint work, and in particular with my PhD students who will be on the job market at some point, so, so there's Dominic Christ very soon. John Kim has something for now, but he may appear later. So if you see him giving the job, he's brilliant, as are the others, and Meran is uh, in his second year. Um, I thought it's time after lunch, so everybody is a little bit, um, right, you know, a little bit quiet and, you know, a little bit sleepy, so I can sneak in a little bit of propaganda about uh, principal two bundles and higher connections, uh, show you some applications of this. Okay, so let's get started. Why would you ever be interested in higher gauge theory? Well, when I came into the subject, or I wanted to do higher gauge theory, my motivation was the following. Uh, so, you know, D-brains, and very crude picture, D-brains interact via strings. The effective description is a theory of the endpoints, kang chan pattern factor, so you get a parallel transport of these endpoints, and you get a gauge theory. And a lot of string theory can be learned by just uh, studying gauge theories. And uh, when I did my second postdoc, the M2 brain models were coming up, so Clearly, there was a question, can you do something for M5 brains? And then you realize, well, M5 brains interact with M2 brains. So effective description should be a theory of these boundaries, of these one-dimensional boundaries, sometimes called self through strings. And the parallel transport of these should lead to a high gauge theory. And there's this mystical um, unicorn, the 2-0 theory in, in string theory. And maybe the 2-0 theory is a high gauge theory, right? So that was my motivation. But there are so many other reasons that you may be interested in it too, because you know that this Calpramont field in, in uh, B field in string theory, and it's known that this is a connection on a gerb, so you already have a, new, a billion higher principal bundle. Um, there are high gauge potential in supergravity in general and in gauge supergravity also. There's, so besides the metric, you have lots of high gauge potentials appearing there. And if you want to do something non-trivial and global, you better bring them in the form of a uh, connection on a higher principal bundle so that you can glue things together consistently. Yeah, that's my motivation, the six dimension superconformal field theories and I'm five branch, or my original motivation. But then there's also lots of mathematicians, so why would you be interested in higher principal bundles there? Well, remember that there's a rich and interesting example of principal bundles in differential geometry. So in the 70s, 80s, when Atiyah studied uh, instantons, monopoles, Atiyah, Hitchin, and all these people, right? The ADHM construction, there's twisters, there's lots of beautiful mathematics actually in principal bundles, and we expect that to be reflected to a certain extent also in higher bundles, right? So, so that's plenty of reason there to be interested in this. Um, um, there's an interesting, well, not an open problem, but there's a few open questions related to higher connections that haven't been answered in the math literature, so something to fill in. Uh, and it leads to beautiful algebraic structures that you know from generalized geometry as well, Courant algebraids and so on. Um, and also, well, one particularly nice application that came out of this is that you can see T-duality um, really at the full level in the sense of um, uh, non-topological, topological, but also uh, the, the background field, the G field, B field, and the phi field can see this as span of principal two bundles, right? So um, contrary to the philosophy that many people followed here using Courant algebraids, I want to do directly T-duality with the backgrounds, with the string backgrounds themselves, and then you get principal two bundles. Okay, so that's the outline. Um, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about the local picture first because it's easier and tell you a little bit about the global picture. It becomes a little bit technical, but not too bad, actually. I give you the outline of the constructions. We see higher monopoles, instantons here, and then T-duality. Um, and I talk a little bit about uh, structures related to generalized geometry up here. Um, but the most important thing, so if you fall asleep because it's just after lunch, after, after this introduction, um, the take-home message is that there's a rumor, and I heard it from, I mean, it's, it's well popular in string theory community, but I recently also heard it from a mathematician, that non-abelian gerbs or higher principal bundles are not interesting, and this is simply wrong. Uh, they can be dealt with adjusted connections and life is good, right? So everything is as it should be. Okay, so um, I was not sure to what extent I should introduce uh, more of the basics, but there's this old argument that parallel transport, if you go higher, requires categorification. And Olaf, not Olaf, but John Huerta has a very nice lecture notes with, with John Bass uh, about this, explaining this in more detail. The thing is just that if you want to, if you have a string and you subdivide it into two parts, 
you can transport it to a string subdivided into two parts at the bottom in two different ways. And if you assume that this is just governed by an ordinary group multiplication, you get this equation, this consistency relation, and then mathematicians have known that this relation leads to the group being abelian in general. For a long, long time, physicists have been rediscovering these things, and therefore there was this mantra that higher parallel transport is actually problematic. But there's a simple way out, namely you work um, one step up with two categories, because in two categories you have this interchange law, where you have two different composition of morphisms, one horizontal and one vertical. You saw that in Neil's talk, for example, there you had e even a third operation, actually. Um, and then you get exactly the relation that you want. It's baked into your theory, and everything is okay, right? So, so if you want to do a consistent higher parallel transport, you should categorify. That's the first lesson. Okay, so what's categorification? I'm not sure that I should say much about this. Just a very uh, quick outline. So mathematical structure, Bobaki style, you know, consists of sets structure functions, structure equations, and categorification just means the sets, sets become categories, structure functions become structure functors, structure equations become structure isomorphisms, so far so good, and then you have to here, sometimes you have to work a little bit to come up with nice coherence relations. The process is not unique, you can impose certain degrees of weakness, strictness, so which structure equations you really want to lift to non-trivial non structure isomorphisms, and uh, there's, there's a whole bunch of them. So strict is usually all the structure isomorphisms are trivial. Weak is the most general thing. And then semi-hemi-strict and all kinds of demi-strict in between. Um, and then you also have a choice of coherence relations depending on what you want to do. Okay, so and as an example, let's quickly look at the Lie 2 algebra. So you know the Lie algebra, sets of vector space, structure, what we have. Bilinear product, structure equations. Well, this bilinear product is anti-symmetric, satisfies Jacobi. And now we can categorify this. Well, the set, the vector space, will become a linear category. I mean, strictly speaking, I categorified the notion here of vector space first, right? So I'm sweeping this a little bit under the rug, right? But so I have a linear category. The structure functors will now be a bracket functor that takes me from this linear category um, with itself to the linear category. And then I lift the structure equations to structure isomorphisms, so I get an alternator that governs the anti-symmetry, and I get a Jacobiator which governs the violation of the Jacobi identity, right? So I can do these things. And you can do this with pretty much any mathematical notion, um, and it works straightforwardly, modulo finding the right coherence diagrams. Okay, so when we want to describe a higher gauge theory or the kinematic information, so connections on principal bundles. Locally, then we want this typical physical infinitesimal description. We need the analog of a gauge algebra. So we want a higher gauge Lie algebra. And now then you go through this process of categorification. And we could choose a weekly two algebra. But there are many other terms that we can use, right? As soon as you go in this categorification, there are lots of different ways of categorizing things and lots of different equivalent ways of describing these things, right? So here, weekly two algebras contain a lot of redundancy in the information. And you can actually boil them down. You can concentrate them to something called two-term EL infinity algebras, and we'll return to them later. If you look at strictly two algebras, so if you categorify, but all the structure isomorphisms are strict, then you get what's called cross-modules of Lie algebras. They really contain the essence of these strictly two algebras. Uh, they're semi-strictly two algebras. This gives you two-term L infinity algebras, and they're simplicial Lie algebras. If you know that uh, you know, this picture by Lurie that and, and others said that you can look at quasi-categories, um, these actually lead you to hypercross modules of Lie algebras, and if you truncate them, you get back to cross modules of Lie algebras. Right? There's this whole zoo of objects that you can essentially use, and it depends a little bit what you want to do with them and what's most convenient. They are mostly equivalent. In some cases, you see a little bit more. We'll see that the EL infinity algebras show you a little bit more than others. But uh, yeah, there's different level of convenience working with them. And for now, let's focus on these nice L infinity algebras because they pop up everywhere, even in physics, right, directly. So what are they? Uh, I mean, there's a big story underlying it. They're the homotopy algebras of Lie algebras. You can use, look at the Lie operat, you causal dualize, you get the commutative operat, you can construct then a homotopy algebra out of them. Let's sweep this under the rug and just say, well, they're generalizations of DG Lie algebras. And the way that you look at them is we have a DG vector space. That means we have a differential complex like this, right? So we have a, an integer grading, something in L0, L minus 1, L minus 2, but also in positive degrees. And uh, we have a differential. And then we have further totally anti-symmetric multilinear products like this, mu i, which take the anti-symmetrized uh, tensor product of L into L, and they have a particular degree, and they satisfy a generalization of the, homotopy, of the Jacobi identity, which we call homotopy Jacobi identity. Explicitly, 
mu1, this thing, you can unpack it for all the values of n. You get here that mu1 is a differential. Uh, that is the derivation of the two bracket, of the bracket mu2. This is schematically written, right? And here we have the Jacobi identity, and you see it's violated up to homotopy, hence the name homotopy algebras, right? So that's what you get, and you construct them, and you can calculate with them, right? I mean, uh, the signs are a little bit awkward, but usually they're also canonically given. A couple of examples. There's a trivial one, of course, where each degree is just a zero-dimensional vector space. Uh, a Lie algebra is, of course, an L-infinity algebra. It better be. We say it's concentrated in degree zero, because the only non-trivial element is a degree zero element. Uh, then you can build L-infinity algebras in many different ways. One nice thing is to look at representations of Lie algebras. And what you do then is that you put the Lie algebra itself in degree zero, and the representation degree minus one, and then there's a nice set of brackets, namely one bracket is just the, the Lie bracket, and the other one is the action of the representation onto that vector space. So these uh, L-infinity algebras are all a little bit boring because they're actually strict, right? So you saw that the mu i are zero for i larger than two. And indeed, if you translate this back into higher Lie algebras in a particular way, then you would find that essentially all these structure isomorphisms are trivial. And therefore, we would like to look at something more interesting, so something that is non-strict. And this is actually the archetypal uh, Lie 2 algebra that is very, very important because you can show that essentially all the Lie 2 algebras can be brought into this form. And uh, this is called the string Lie 2 algebra, or rather Lie 2 algebra model of the string Lie algebra, but let's not go there. Uh, what you have is you have something in degree 0, which is spin n, and you have something in degree minus 1, which is just abelian in R. Looks a little bit boring, but it's actually interesting enough to give nice examples. So the bracket is just mu2, it's just a commutator. The differential is zero, there's nothing there, right? Um, and mu3 is just given by the evident co-cycle that you have here, right? So it's a very simple construction, but you can show that a lot of, essentially all examples are of uh, similar uh, structure. Yeah, well, no, no, not higher spin, sorry, sorry. It's a categorified version of spin Lie 2R. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if you look for a higher, you know, SU2 is kind of the nicest. Yeah, so, so SU2 is kind of the nice example that we use for non-abelian gauge theory. That's the first interesting example. And here you see that string 3 uh, is an obvious nice example to study in this context to give interesting models, right? Okay, so what's also nice about them is they're not only nice higher versions of Lie algebras, but they also come with their own gauge theory. Namely, remembering that L-infinity algebras are just generalizations of DG Lie algebras, we recall that for DG Lie algebras we have the maurer carton equation, uh, which is of this form, right? So we have a, a gauge potential, which is in degree one, and then we have a generalized curvature or curvature, which just looks like this, and the maurer carton equation just says that this is zero, right? Uh, there's an evident generalization, homotopy maurer cartan theory. We have something in degree one. The curvature is generalized in the obvious way, right? So we have the usual part that we would expect and then we just generalize. Uh, the equation of motion would be that this is equal to zero. And this actually fixes everything that we want because higher gauge transformations are then partially flat homotopies. Whatever that is, you can directly derive. This fixes really gauge transformation. You get Bianchi identities. And we have the full kinematical data for locally for high gauge theory, right? We have gauge potentials, curvatures, um, uh, the Gertz transformations, and the Bianchi identities. Something that's always missed in the literature, or not always, but in many, many papers that's swept under the rug, is that there's also a nice notion of inner product called the cyclic structure. And if you have that, then these equations become variational, and you have a homotopy maurer cartan action. And actually, what you can show using BV formalism is that any classical field theory is of this form, right? So if there's one physical field theory that you should know, it's this one, because any field theory can be brought into this form, no matter what. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, any perturbative, right? So, so, yeah. I mean, your field space should be a vector space, and then you're good. Uh, with metric is with cyclic structure. If, you're, if your L infinity algebra that you have happens to have a cyclic structure on it, not actually, it's a metric, it's a particular pairing, right? So I swept, it satisfies the obvious compatibility condition that these brackets act as derivations onto that and it's invariant, right? It's like think quadratic Lie algebra, but you want to generalize it to this thing. That, that's exactly what it is, right? And probably some degeneracy condition and then you have it. Yes, in the dual picture, you have the differential grade commutative algebra, and you get it uh, exactly so. So, yeah. 
Okay, so one last thing before we come to concrete physics. Uh, there's a nice construction, namely the generalization that differential graded or that a commutative algebra tensor Lie algebra is a Lie algebra. Uh, differential graded commutative algebra tensor and L infinity algebra also leads an L infinity algebra. And what you do is you just tensor the vector spaces. The degrees add and the products are given in the obvious way. So the differential is given in this way, right? So you take the differential from your DGCOM algebra and here the differential from your L infinity algebra and the higher differential is just given in the obvious way, right? So it has to be commutative, otherwise it doesn't work. But there's this nice construction, right? So we have everything together. We saw a Li2 algebra that's nice, string Li2. We have our Deram complex. Let's write down a higher gauge theory, right? So we take the tensor product of the Deram complex with string n, which we had before, right? This was a string Li2 algebra. What do we get? Well, we get a one form, one form with values in spin n, and we get a two form that's just abelian, right? Abelian doesn't mean non-interacting, right? It's, it's still interacting, there's still terms that, that uh, uh, things that happen and things that matter, right? But it's, it's, just, it's just an R factor, it's an abelian one form. The higher products are given in the evident way, and then the homotopy mauer katan curvatures look like this. Okay, so this is nice. That, that came just out of the general construction. We didn't do much. We just said, okay, generalize uh, homotopy um, uh, mauer carton theory to the case of L infinity algebras. You come out with the curvatures and, of course, the corresponding gauge transformations. Okay, so then you want to use that in physics somewhere because you know well, I mean, there's mathematics that comes from principal bundles and then we can make things global. And then you look at the supergravity literature and you see, oh, well, the F looks good, right? It's the usual curvature, but um, the H doesn't look good. Right, so, so that's not the same expression. And these people did this by hand. This is what, what, what physics worked out. I mean, then the gauge transformations are nice. The uh, Bianchi identities are the ones that you need for uh, uh, green, uh, green Schwarz anomaly cancellation and so on. So, so that th they came up with this. This is what we want. This is what mathematics tells us. So how do we fix this? Um, well, enter Urs and collaborators. So Urs, Hisham, uh, Jim Staschev was also involved in this and Domenico Fiorenza. And they realized that what you can do in this high gauge theory business is that it can redefine the three form curvature by adding this additional term, right? And it happens that if you take this term that you get anyway, and you add this additional term AF to it, you get exactly the transcendence term that you want. They were interested in producing, exactly reproducing the supergravity example, right? So, so that was their motivation. But if you look at this, and this is very much hidden in the higher uh, principal bundle literature, unfortunately. I mean, hopefully not as much because we wrote our papers, but this is very much little. What you get is all kinds of very pleasant side effects, namely the gauge transformations of B change, and H suddenly becomes gauge invariant. We return to this point later. This is something very, very important. Physics would say the BRST complex is now closed. Before, if you looked at the gauge transformation, the BRST complex actually open, and it closes only up to this equation F equals zero. And this equation destroys, and this is this makes everything much harder, and I'll say a few more words later. So what we did is we just said, Let, let's drop this concrete case, and let's go general, and let's call a local adjustment of curvature anything, any modification of the curvatures in such a way that the BRC complex closed. Note that, um, that, that, of course, the definition is a little bit more complicated to make sure that this is all consistent, but you can modify your higher form curvatures with lower forms in such a way this will change the gauge transformation and the BRST complex can close. Um, it means that the Lie algebra, the action of the Lie algebra of gauge transformations is really a proper action. It's, it's not a problem, right? So, so the gauge transformations close by themselves without any additional condition. Um, that's physics lingo, sorry, I shouldn't, probably shouldn't use that, right? Not really, no, sorry. I mean, what you have is gauge transformation acting on potential, right? And then you, you concatenate two gauge transformations, right? You take one gauge transformation, you take another one, and you, the concatenation should be again a gauge transformation. You see that this implies, this is almost equivalent to this statement, okay? And this statement is bad because it means that you are partially flat, okay? Yes. Yes. It, it does have, but uh, this is, well, yeah, I mean, uh, what, what you see appearing in these is that the commutator of two gauge transformations doesn't close two gauge transformation, it closes up to terms that contain F. If F is zero, these terms go away and I have a Lie algebra of gauge transformations. 
Well, yes, exactly. This is why my physicists would say this is open, so it, the gauge transformation work up to equations of motion, what physicists would say. But this is, not a, this is a very, very bad equation of motion. That's what shouldn't happen, right? That's the problem. I want to get rid of this condition, and this can be done by changing the definition of curvature. It's something that doesn't happen in ordinary gauge theory, um, as you know it, right? So in ordinary gauge theory, you your gauge transformations they just act on the potentials, and there's a Lie algebra of gauge transformations. Here, this is not the case. They, they don't act this simply. I'll return to this point later. It probably then becomes clearer. Sorry for using physics lingo here. Right? So what I want is that gauge transformations are nice. Let's put it like this. But now you see, um, in this adjustment, we had an additional algebraic datum that we used here that is not in the L-infinity algebra itself. Right? This datum, this, this, in the case of string, it's just uh, the killing form, cut and killing form. Uh, and you could ask, where do these things come from? They are not part of my gauge algebra, right? And then you look in the literature and you see, well, I mean, there was this notion of two-term EL infinity algebras in which we don't just lift the Jacobi identity, but we also lift the antisymmetry. And then you see, look, I mean, this is actually sitting, this Cartan killing form is sitting exactly here in what's called the alternator. Okay, so the alternator, which is invisible in the L infinity algebra because we don't have it there, is actually responsible for this adjustment datum. And when we realized that, I mean, there's an old paper by Reutenberg, I mean, he didn't phrase it in these terms, right, of course, but um, when we realized that, we said, well, maybe there's something to these EL infinity algebras and we should develop them further. And then you can see the following. So, I mean, first of all, you have this whole family of two-term EL infinity algebras that are all quasi-isomorphic to the original string one, right? And the, the family is given by alpha. If alpha is equal to zero, you see the alternator drops out and just get an L infinity algebra. And this is precisely string n. If alpha is equal to one, I get an H Lie algebra. So I get something where the alternator is lifted, but the Jacobiator is trivial, right? And the alternator becomes literally the adjustment datum. And then there's a little bit of structure theory there. Any EL infinity algebra can be actually anti-symmetrized to an L infinity algebra. And the anti-symmetrization produces always, in all of these cases, string n. Okay, so why is that nice? Well, now we're making actually contact a little bit to generalized geometry. Uh, and this uh, came up in, at the beginning of the week, right? In, I think in the first or second talk. There's an, an old theorem by Fiorenza, Domenico Fiorenza and Manetti uh, that was rediscovered then by Getzler in 2009. So if you have a differential graded Lie algebra, then you automatically get an L infinity algebra structure on the shifted truncated complex via derived brackets, right? So DG Lie algebra, you go over here to L infinity algebra. What you see if you have these alternators around, if you work with H Lie algebras or these EL infinity algebras, is that there's a step in between, namely you can go from DG Lie, shift truncate to this one, and then anti-symmetrize. This is not a particularly hard theorem, but it's, it's, it's not there in the literature. But I think most of you know that, or at least partially know this already, because it happens in generalized geometry. So Kuro algebraoid, is, as uh, Dima Reutenberg told us, we should regard it as a symplectically two algebraoid. We get this DG language that we had before. Um, we get a free DG com algebra and a symplectic form that gives us a DG Poisson algebra. DG Poisson is, of course, in particular DG Lie. Okay? And then the Lie bracket, and uh, well, I can apply this construction, right? I have a DG Lie algebra. I can go here to shift truncate, and what you get is the Dorfman bracket, but not only the Dorfman bracket, also the full H Lie 2 algebra, so also the alternator and so on. Right? If you then anti-symmetrize, oh, sorry, if you then anti-symmetrize from the H Lie 2 to the L infinity, you find the Kuron bracket, and you find it as part of the anti-symmetrization of the L infinity algebra, including the Jacobiator, right? So in ordinary Kuron algebra, I mean, the story has been known for a long, long time with all these derived brackets, that's just not, not, not particularly interesting. But this is the simplest example, the archetypal example of this construction, right? So DG, the derived brackets, give you the Dorfman bracket and um, the Kuron bracket. Okay, but now the interesting thing for us is that this allows us to define adjustments because what you can show is any L infinity algebra obtained by shift truncation from a DG Lie algebra and subsequent anti symmetrization, so via our theorem, admits an adjustment and it's very mathematically very natural of the resulting curvatures, right? So whenever we construct an L infinity algebra in this two step procedure, the H Lie 2 algebra will tell us the adjustment. So we get the adjustment for free. And that is quite exciting because we have explicit formulas for the adjustment curvature. We don't have to work. The stringly two algebra can be produced. And most importantly, and this nice physics uh, application, are these tensor hierarchies of gauge supergravity. 
Let me just show you this slide and briefly go through it. It doesn't matter what, what gauge supergravity really is. Uh, important thing is that the input data is essentially differential graded Lie algebra like this. And from this, physicists construct curvature forms like this, right? I mean, here's an ordinary curvature. These are all structure constants. Don't worry about what, what they precisely mean. The red terms are adjustment terms. These are the terms that you don't find if you would start from L infinity algebras. And physicists really construct them by hand, right? I mean, they look at this curvature, they say, oh my god, it doesn't transform covariantly. Let's put a B field in. You get a new curvature, you define the curvature. Oh my god, it doesn't transform covariantly. Let's put a three form in, and so on. It's a lot of work to construct this, right? There's papers written just on this construction. From our perspective, we take this DG Lie algebra, shift truncate to an H Lie 2 algebra, we get the alternators. The alternators give us directly all the adjustments, and we're done. Right? Actually, two is just uh, you have a binary bracket that is the unlock of the Lie bracket that's not anti-symmetric and an alternator, but in all degrees, right? So, so it's a slight, it's a simple generalization of what Rottenbeck did, right? So, right. So, so uh, the important thing is that the alternators do give you the adjustments, and uh, the nice thing is, you know, if you do this gauge supergravity, that's all very nice. But if you want to do that on a global, globally topologically non-trivial manifold, you better make sure that you have princi higher principal bundles to um, capture the global structure, right? This is mathematically rigorous. This is what you would expect, and this leads to bundle constructions. Okay, so now how am I doing for time? I think I'm good, actually. Sorry if I'm a little bit fast. Um, that's the proof of this theorem. It's technical. I mean, you look at it and you just, I mean, sorry, this is a very highbrow view of this whole thing. Yes. Yes. Uh, that's an interesting question. What you would expect is that actually, if you have these EL infinity algebras, um, yeah, if you have these, there should be a Motobi Mauer Katan theory for these that hasn't been developed. They're, that hasn't been developed. So they're morally Lee, so of course there must be one. But uh, actually, one of my PhD students is trying to do that at the moment. So Bruno Vallet is confident that we can do that, but it hasn't been done, right? So, so this math is, hasn't been developed, right? These EL infinity algebras, we wrote them down, and they are, they're actually not completely done yet. So that's, this is new. This is, hasn't been explored at all, right? So um, we hope that you can do something. But I can show you in the definition of principle two bundles how to get there and how you can get it from a different angle as well. This is a local description. This is one way to higher gauge theory. There's another way that gives you the global description via bundles, and there you see everything coming out directly. Okay, so here I just want to say that there's a new algebraic structure, which you're actually familiar with from generalized geometry to a certain degree, that gives you in the general case all the curvatures, and you don't have to do any computations by hand. It just comes out automatically. Okay, so then uh, let's do a little bit, go in a little bit in dangerous waters, right? So this to zero theory that's mentioned up here is a little bit of holy grail in string theory, and there is a consensus in the string theory community that there is no classical description of this, right? So, so what I'm telling you now is considered completely impossible by a lot of string theorists, but I'll show you that is actually not that problematic. The story of this is that there's a particular class of quantum field theories, namely conformal field theories, which are particularly interesting and very important. We learned a lot from them. And then you can look at the conformal algebra of RPQ, classify the supersymmetric extensions, and NAMA has done that, and he found that they only exist in dimensions up to six. <coughs> Examples for dimensions less than four, less equal four, have been known for a long time, and there was a belief that four is actually the maximum for interacting QFTs, but then along comes Witten in 1995 and finds that there is in type 2b superstring theory and later also in M theory, that there is a mysterious six-dimensional theory. We know the supersymmetric content very well, Gravity is actually decoupling, so it's really just a gauge theory, or well, it's a theory without gravity. And it contains a two-form field, which has a self-dual three-form curvature. We know the observables are Wilson surfaces, so something two-dimensional, pointing towards a higher parallel transport. There are huge interests and would improve our understanding significantly, but everybody agrees that this is, well, everybody but few people probably, that this is, should be impossible. There's lots of objections to classical description, but uh, if, if you have your favorite objection, come to me and tell you why this is not really that relevant. Let's not go through them. Uh, so let's do what we learned. Namely, we can start from these adjusted string structures, right? We know what the string group is. We can construct corresponding adjusted structures. 
And then the question is, what do we do with this kinematical information? Where do we slot this in? Well, there was a very nice paper uh, based on some, some gauges of a gravity construction in 2011, where they constructed a higher theory with um, interesting field content of a 1-0 theory. And uh, they, they derived some algebraic relations. But these algebraic relations, they, they didn't know what they had, right? So, so there were them, some weird relations of algebras of structure constants. And it happens that adjusted string structures precisely match this definition, right? And what they actually recovered is actually an adjusted high gauge theory. They just didn't know that and they didn't call it at this time, right? And then what you can do is you take the Lagrangian, you improve it a little bit because the Lagrangian didn't account for self-duality. So this is something, these, these, all these Hebrew letter terms, they are all um, making sure that the uh, three form is self-dual. And this is a completely supersymmetric action as a self-dual three form. And it has a, uh, yeah, a one zero tensor multiplet in it. And I mean, if you don't know what this is, it's not that important. It's a very nice high gauge theory. And this actually contradicts a lot of the no-go theorems that uh, string, theory so string theorists had before, right? So this exists, it's fine. You can put this on any manifold. There's an underlying higher bundle construction. Mathematically, there's no problem whatsoever with this theory. This action is a variant of the high gauge. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. Touching cover test is there's a certain um, uh, gauge group in string theory that you, uh, well, in the dimensional reduction of the 2 0 theory to five dimensions that you would expect to pop out. And it's absolutely unclear how to get this in six dimensions. So in six dimensions, you have the ADE groups. And there's a certain embedding that is completely opaque how it should ever work, right? There's a branching that is, seems to be impossible. That is it, right? But it's just a test, right? So, I mean, I have no idea how to pass this test. Everything else are the standard obstruction. That's a so sophisticated obstruction. This is more if you have already a theory. Can your theory do that? That would be nice, right? So, I mean, we do have all kinds of nice features of these. We have a two-form potential. We have interactions. We have self-duality of the curvature, gauge uh, supersymmetry. We don't have two-zero supersymmetry. And uh, we have reductions to young mills, to M2 brain models. So a lot of the standard tests that you would do work. And for physicists, what we would say, we can describe the tensor branch of the 2-0 theory classically, right? So, so this theory describes really the so-called tensor branch, um, analog of the Coulomb branch of the 2-0 theory, and it's fine. There's no, no problem with it whatsoever. Okay, but now let's leave um, this slightly dangerous territory, because if you talk about this, people will, will, uh, may attack you. And instead, do something nicer mathematically and go to the global picture, because we get really beautiful constructions out of here too. Okay, so if you want to go global, uh, gauge algebras are no longer sufficient, so we need higher gauge groups, right? So categorify a group, you remember our little prescription for categorification. Uh, what do you do with a group? Well, a set becomes a category. Product and identity are seen as structure maps, right? Identity, you, you encode this as a map from the one object group into the group. Um, and you have inverses, and then you get associators, unitors, and I'm not sure, is there a fancy word for actually the, the inverses, inversors or something? I don't know, right? I mean, most of the time, these, uh, the, the inverses, that doesn't give you anything interesting. So, uh, sorry, the unitors don't give you anything interesting. So we stick with the associators. Okay, and now, again, just as for the higher Lie algebra, there's this whole zoo of, higher, of descriptions of higher groups that you can access from simplicial Lie groups to all kinds of other things. But what we'll do here is we go to the strict case and then we can use so-called crossed modules of Lie groups. These crossed modules of Lie groups are just pairs of Lie groups, and you usually write them like this, where T is a Lie group homomorphism, and there's a left action by automorphism of G on H, and we have these two relations. Right? And uh, John Bias and Aaron Lauder showed a long time ago that the category of Lie groups is equivalent to the category of, uh, sorry, of cross modules of Lie groups is equivalent to the category of strictly two groups, and it's just that if you have a strictly two group, which is a particular monoidal category, you can always bring it into this form. And then you see the tensor product is just encoded in terms of the cross module data. And you can go both ways, right? So, so that's not a problem. It's very, very direct, this construction. Um, you could ask, why do we focus on strictly two groups? Well, there's a rectification theorem, as usual, uh, in, in ordinary categorification, that any higher Lie group is equivalent to a strict one. And if you try to do what I'm doing now with non-strict one, all hell breaks loose and things become incredibly complicated, right? So if you want to do global things, you better stick to strict ones. Um, yeah. Okay. So how do we define a principal fiber bundle? Um, well, essentially, you can define 
all the definitions that you can think of have higher versions and you can follow them and there are so many different definitions, different approaches to this. Um, okay, so I come from a physics background where I would like to calculate with things. I want local differential forms which I can plug into equations of motions, have differential equations and therefore description in terms of transition functions is very good. So what do we do? Well, we take our manifold x, uh, a subjective submersion, so cover of the manifold, think a cover, that's the simplest one, but I can do something more general. And from that you can construct the so-called check groupoid, which has as its objects just the larger space, so the disjoint union of all the patches if you want to think of a cover, and as its morphisms just the double overlaps. Right? And then there's an obvious notion of morphism, you can concatenate them, there's an obvious notion of inverse, you just flip them around, and you have a nice check groupoid. And then the principal G bundle for an ordinary group is nothing but a functor from this check groupoid into the delooping of the gauge group, so that's the want to regard it as the one object category with G worth of morphisms, right? So you get a functor and you, you see then, I mean, on, on, on the objects it doesn't contain any information. On the double overlaps it contains the transition functions and functoriality, so compatibility with composition here and here, automatically implies the, the usual law of transition functions, right? And then you can go further, which is particularly nice about this, functor is a transition function, equivalences of bundle isomorphisms are natural isomorphisms and so on, right? So, so you have the whole structure pops out of this simple picture. And now the nice thing is that this immediately categorifies, right, the check groupoid is automatically a two-groupoid, trivially, right? Like every set is trivially a category, every category is trivially a two-category. So check groupoid is trivially a two-groupoid. And what I can do here is I can just plug in my higher group, this higher group over here, and promote it to lead two-groupoid with one object, so that I have the analogs part of this one, and just define lux or weak, fu weak functors, right? Weak two functors. And if you do that, you get the the correct co-cycle conditions, right? You work out what it is, you crank the wheel a little bit, it's trivial to work out, it's a little bit technical, uh, and you get the, a nice topological description of principal two bundles. So if you want to put connections on these things, then there's many, many ways for doing that, but uh, it's a little bit harder, I should mention, there's Paolo Ascheri in the audience, and Pranjo Yocho was here last week. Uh, Roberto Zucchini is here as well, right? So, so a lot of people tried from different perspectives. At the moment, actually, I know at least four groups working on the Atia groupoid description of these higher connections. That seems to be popular for some reason, suddenly. And uh, yeah, I mean, our, our picture will be out very soon. In all of these, more or less, you obtain the following data. You have here the topological part, right? So you have a particular function on double overlaps and another function on triple overlaps. And this is really the part that makes up the connection. You have a one form on patches. You have an additional two form, right? And then you have one formula that clues things together. And this is nice, this is what you know at infinitesimal level already from the L-infinity algebra story. But then there's also this delta sticking out, right? Okay, so the local curvature forms look like this, which is also nice, which is what we had also in the L-infinity algebra case. But again, there's this T delta, right, which is a little bit strange. In most of the later works, so in particular when Urs and Konrad looked at paro higher power transport, this was simply put to zero. Right, they just put this to zero, the curvature was just this, but then you have to pay a price for it, namely for consistency you have to put f equals zero, and this is not a nice thing to do. This f that uh, comes out naturally, this is sometimes called the fake curvature in the original paper by Prien and Messing, and we can't live with or without it actually in the traditional formulation, because without this condition the higher power transport is no longer parenterization invariant which is a bad thing, right? Parallel transport should be reparameterization invariant. If you try to close gauge transformations, you get this condition here. This is consistency of transformation. You can say, of course, this is part of your co-cycle relation, so f better be something that is zero, but it doesn't look nice. I mean, this is the analog of uh, the BRST complex being not being closed in the finite picture. Um, if you're interested in self-duality in six dimensions like I am, this is not good because if I don't impose f equals zero, the, the condition that h is self-dual, the three form is self-dual in six dimension, is not gauge covariant. There's this covariant piece and then there's another ugly piece which messes up the equation of motion, right? So that's not an option. We need to impose this condition. However, if you impose this condition, principal 1g bundles, which should be ordinary principal bundles and are at the topological level, they are only flat principal g bundles. Moreover, you can show, and it's actually, I mean, there's an analyst who showed this, uh, we were not quite aware of that, and then we showed it uh, just from simple physical arguments. It's very, very simple, the proof. Higher connections are locally abelian. 
if you impose this condition. And this is actually, I th I'm, I'm pretty sure what physicists tried, what string theorists tried, and realized, oh, this is all rubbish because if we can locally gauge away the higher connections to abelian jobs, I can just stick with abelian jobs, right? I mean, it's like the picture we saw this morning with this, all this work for nothing, right? Um, and this is the reason actually for the rumor that non-abelian jobs are not interesting. However, as we saw in the infinitesimal case, these curvatures are not good enough, you need to adjust. And now, you can do that, and many, not all, high gauge groups come with this adjustment data. And this is now the finite analog of this infinitesimal adjustment that you have seen before. So it's a map from the higher group and the corresponding Lie algebra in Lie algebra of degree minus one. It has to satisfy some relation. This relation actually splits into two relations. You can analyze that a little bit further. Um, and if it satisfies this, it provides a good notion of curvature, and all your problems melt away, right? So. Um, it specifies in particular this weird delta that stuck out a little bit in terms of transition functions and curvatures, right? So, so this delta that was there before is exactly the room that we need for an adjustment. And we can, using, using this map kappa, we can give it in terms of G and F. Then you write down the corresponding curvature co cycle co boundary relation. Everything is nice, everything works out. You can chop the whole discussion of fake flatness, all problems go away. And recently, actually, and uh, Th Thomas Strobel actually observed this in theories where you have not a gauge algebra, but a gauge algebra, so think gauge sigma models. If you have a connection on your Lie algebra and you want compatibility with that, you also need to adjust, right? So I, I only learned this really recently, so they observed the same thing. It seems to be happening as soon as you have two curvatures and some additional structure. Um, Okay, and then you, you write down the global picture, right? These are the co-cycles for an adjusted bundle. See the adjustment enters here, the gauge transformation for the B. Everything else is as we know it from the literature. There are uh, many, many examples, but the first test that you want to do is you want to see an ordinary principal bundle as an adjusted higher bundle, see if that works. And indeed, what you can do is you can look at an ordinary gauge group as a two group where you take the based paths in the group based at the identity and the based loops. And you know, uh, based paths, modular loops is just the group itself, right? Because if you just look at paths, modular loops, you just have the endpoint, you get uh, the group back itself. There's natural adjustment, and you can embed ordinary bundles now finally into higher bundles without any problems. Okay, but this is not particularly interesting, just looking at ordinary bundles. Instead, uh, let's, let's do something more interesting. Let's, let's uh, look at bundles that we know from physics and also from mathematics that are in important and interesting. The first one is the Dirac monopole, right? So we know that this is just a Hopf vibration with this very nice coincidence that Hopf uh, discovered the vibration in the same year that Dirac postulated the monopole in 1931. Um, and you know it's uh, spin three, the total space SU2, right? Over spin three divided by spin two, SU2 over U1 which is the two-sphere, right? So that's just the usual Hopf vibration. Then the instanton usually is the quaternionic Hopf vibration, the, the fundamental instanton. We can generalize it a little bit to the doubled instanton, so where we have not SU2 as a group, but SU2 cross SU2, which is spin four, right? And we can regard the total space of spin five as a spin four bundle over S4, right? And that gives you us the doubled instanton. If you look at the, the, there's a canonical way in which you define connections on such uh, principal bundles. And if you look at this, you really get the, the fundamental uh, instanton in SU2, the fundamental anti-instanton in the other SU2 factor. Um, so a long time ago, I, I went to Adelaide and met that David Roberts, and I asked him, can you give me a really, really nice principal two-band that's topologically non-trivial? At the time, we were interested in twister constructions, and we wanted some example, at least, that we can get something non-trivial. And he then came up with the idea, well, why don't you just take these things and replace spin with string? And indeed, he then, then worked this out topologically, and he showed that you get nice uh, additional bundles. Uh, you get a higher version of Dirac monopole and a higher instanton. The interesting thing is, in these higher groups, um, these are essentially central extensions of ordinary spin groups, and the central extension drops out. So string, string 3 over string 2 is still S2. String 5 over string 4 is still S4. So just by replacing spin with the higher analog of string, you get interesting higher bundles. But then, now that we have the adjustment, we can really go beyond topology, right? So 
what we wrote down in 2022 is a fully adjusted differential co-cycle data. So now the connections uh, with all the gluing conditions, with everything uh, as you would want for these higher instantons here, for example, we give explicit. I mean, this is just an abelian gerb, so this is not that interesting. But this one, you really need the full adjustment machinery. You write it down, everything works out, and you get a truly non-abelian principle two bundle that is physically relevant because that's to a certain extent, it's the M-theory lift of both an instanton and a monopole, actually. Uh, the monopole um, is, is captured in M-theory by the so-called non-abelian self dual string. And what you find here is that the three-form field exactly satisfies the non-abelian self dual string equation, right? So, so this is uh, the geometric picture of a higher uh, monopole. But also, of course, it has instantons underlying, so you could also regard it as a higher instanton. It's the same thing. Mathematically, you would call this a string structure, actually, on S4. Just like other, yeah, so, so which is a lift of a spin structure to, to something higher. Okay, but the nicest example, I think, um, the one that I like the most at the moment is T duality, right? So, I mean, we have this notion of adjusted connections. You can, of course, say, um, well, what's that good for? Is that any, uh, any, anything reasonable to do? We need non trivial examples. We got geometry out. We, we know that in physics we want them, but okay, I just wrote down some models, right? So, but T-duality is really where you get something very, very nice. Fortunately, we had the introduction to T-duality already this morning, so roughly equivalence of string theory of strings moving in two different uh, target spaces with one cycles with you one action. Standard example, the simplest example is just a direct product, right, which is not very interesting. But more complicated examples we saw also this morning that there can be a topology change. And uh, very characteristic is actually a full action of the T-duality group, ODDZ. So instead of doing string theory, we just do low energy limits. That means supergravity. And we just do the nervous schwartz sector. So we have just, and just the bosonic part. So we just have a metric, a two-form field, and a dilaton. And uh, in the T-duality picture, it's nice to interpret the metric as a metric on a base space. And then the rest of the metric along the fibers of our circle vibration, right, uh, should come from a Kaluza-Klein metric, so from the gauge potentials together with the dilaton, right? So there's a restriction of how a connection on one bundle together with the dilaton gives us the missing components of this connection. The true form, of course, is a connective structure on a gerb, so an abelian principal bundle. Now, for the discussion of, of topological t-duality, a uh, geometric string background is just a Riemannian manifold x, a principal torus bundle over it, and a abelian gerb on the total space of that thing, right? So, so this is what would be a geometric string background. And um, of course, because of the topological classes involved, you can map this over to generalized geometry and Kuhn algebra and discuss t-duality there. But you can also try to do it directly, right? So let's directly work with the geometric string background, no auxiliary constructions whatsoever. And the idea is, the first step is to combine the torus bundle and this gerb into a single object, right? I mean, it's a little bit awkward to have in these um, geometric string backgrounds to have a torus bundle and then an abelian job on top of this torus bundle, right? So why not describe this as a single object? And indeed you can do that, and this is uh, Konrad Waldorf and uh, Thomas Nikolaus. I think there were early ideas by, um, uh, by Valentino and others. Um, so you can combine this. There's a two-group, whatever that two-group is, it's a little bit complicated, and principal two-group bundles are string backgrounds. They are in one-to-one -one correspondence. This is just a two-group that classifies these string backgrounds. That's fine, that's the first step. So we bundled everything up into one object. Then we saw that characteristic for T-duality is really this action of ODDZ, right? But on this TBF2N, uh, on this two-group that we just had, there's no natural action. And this is also the appeal of going to Kuhn algebra, it's because this group acts very, very naturally on the tangent, cotangent part of the, of the Kuhn algebra, right? But what um, uh, Waldorf and Nicolas saw is that there is an equivalent two-group. Well, no, it's not equivalent, sorry. There's another two-group such that the classifying spaces of two bundles are equivalent. Right? So if, as long as you look at two bundles, it doesn't matter which two group you choose. Right? The two groups are actually not equivalent, but the classifying space are equivalent. It's a little bit weird. Um, and this two group looks like this, so it's very, very harmless. And its automorphism group is a, a two group extension of the t-duality group. Okay, so automatically we have a natural action of the t-duality group onto this two group. And from this, you can construct a span of two groups, which is very beautiful. So you have our TBFN2, F2N. This was the one for the string backgrounds down here. You have an, this other group, TDN, which is the one here, 
On this, we have the automorphism action of the T-duality group. So in particular, we have also T-dualities themselves act on this two group. And we have a projection. So now we can either take this projection directly, like here, so morphism of two groups, it's harmless, or we can first apply a T-duality and then project. And that gives us a second flag. This is only at the level of two groups, right? There's no bundles, no jerks, nothing involved so far, right? Just at the level of two groups, we have this map. And now what happens is that this map at the level of two groups induces a span at the level of two bundles, which corresponds to T-duality, right? So you have PC, which is a principal TDN bundle. You have these two things, which are principal TBF2N bundles. So these are both string backgrounds. One is obtained directly, the other one is obtained by T-duality and then applying the direct projection. Um, yeah, so the job and the circle vibration are combined into these two bundles. And in this way, what Nicolas and Waldorf showed in 2018 is that you can describe topological T-duality, right? So in the sense of Bunke and, and also the earlier, the, the Matai, Bauknecht and so on. Um, so the geometric T-duality can be fully captured um, in this at the topological level. And then uh, Conrad was over in Edinburgh for Viva and we, we talked a little bit about this and I said, well, we have this nice technique of adjustments we're using, looking for, for application. And I said, well, we were always trying to put connections on these things to differentially refine it to get really the Busher rules out, right? Because what's missing here in topological T-duality, you need to put connections on these things to really see the Busher rules for the B field and the uh, one-form connection. And yeah, they, they said, well, we were never able to, to complete this picture because it, did, it just didn't work. And I said, well, let's try adjustments. And indeed, it just works. It just comes out. And the adjustment's actually already here. So in the two group that they discussed, they have this bilinear pairing here. That's the adjustment, right? It's already, the data is already there. Uh, it's not particularly hard to write down. Um, you write down the differentially refined co-cycles straightforwardly. You can even generalize this to affine torus bundles and so on. There's one little difficulty, it's not a difficulty, but one subtlety. This is at the topological level, you can just work with two group, uh, two group bundles. But if you go to the differential refinement, you need the, the B field, you need the one forms for the Klein metric, but you also need the dilaton. Okay? So instead of just working with two group bundles, you actually need to extend it to a two group point because you also have additional scalar fields. But there's a very obvious choice for what the two group should be, extending this picture actually. So topologically it's the same, but just with the additional dilaton, it has a little bit more. And we, we, we did all of that, and then we stopped because we, we also have a long project on double copy, so we ran out of time. But then Konrad Waldorf took this and ran with it, and then he found that our construction also produces the Busher rules locally. So um, this is really full uh, T-duality, modulo the, the, the Ramon-Ramon fluxes, right, just the the Neve-Schwarz sector at a topologically non-trivial sector. And um, you can really write down explicit examples. For example, if you want to do one of the standard examples in physics, is this Neil manifolds. Uh, don't worry about the details. I mean, the point of this slide is just to show you, you really write down these code cycles explicitly. There are just certain expressions you can write down. You have every, all the data is explicit, right? It's not, not an abstract construction at all. You can calculate with these things. You see exactly how T-duality acts on the different components and how you get the local string backgrounds out. Okay, so then uh, let me probably already finish. Um, I hope I could convince you with a little bit of propaganda and mm, coffee coma induced, uh, well, ability to convince you. Non-abelian jerks are well-defined and useful. This standard mantra that they are not interesting is just simply not true. And similarly, higher gauge theory is well-defined and useful. You adjust curvatures, things become physically relevant, right? If nowhere else, engage supergravity and supergravity always, right? Mathematically, you get interesting higher geometric structures that beg to be explored as very, very little research on this, right? So if you're a differential geometer, you have a PhD student without a project, and that's something very fruitful. Lots of low-hanging fruits. Um, we had applications of the local formulation that we saw, local adjustments, engaged supergravity, and we have an action for the tensor branch of the 2-0 theory. Uh, we had this global formulation, and we could see higher analogs of monopoles and instantons that should play a role in M-theory. And there's a very direct description, so directly string backgrounds of T-duality in terms of spans of principal two bundles with connections. And along the way, we saw a few flowers that, that arose, and this is what, what makes for me the fascination with this, doing this research out, is you get new geometric structures like these adjustments, which are really structures at the level of the gauge groups, and you get new homotopy algebras that needed to be constructed, right? A lot of nice mathematics that pops out along the way. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
Um, in, in this case, yes. I mean, you have to reformulate them a little bit to make this. I mean, there's a theorem that you can lift a spin structure to a string structure if the first fraction of Pontryagin class is vanishing. This is essentially what happens here, right? So, so what you do is you take the doubled instanton. Where are we? You take the doubled instanton, you combine instanton, anti-instanton, the Pontryagin class vanishes, you can lift it up to a string. You mean in the t-duality case? Yes. The adjustment is given for you, right? The adjustment is, auto, is, is part of the two-group data. It's, it's just this map that was there all along, right? It's just like in the, remember in the case of string groups, we used as the adjustment the killing form, and here it happens that there's another bilinear map that offers itself to be used as an adjustment. Uh, not quite, almost. I mean, what, what the adjustment does, it allows you to generalize your definition and connection in a way that you have non-flat, non-fake flat connections, right? There's a class of fake flat connections that you always have, right? This is where this f is equal to zero, okay? You remember, the curvature consists of two form. We have a two-form curvature and a three-form curvature. The two-form curvature equals zero. You can always write curvatures, uh, connections down like this. That, that always exists. However, we want something where f is non-zero, something non-fake flat, and for that we need to turn on an adjustment. And the adjustment allows us to do that. Yes. 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 Precisely. You need an adjustment. This is why why uh, Nicolas and Waldorf couldn't do this, right? Because they didn't know about adjustments, right? This is why they couldn't finish the topological picture to the non-topological one. That's precisely the reason. Okay, but, sorry, maybe I missed something. What I was asking was whether you couldn't, you couldn't understand this adjustment yes. if you had a two-form curvature that was non-fake flat. Yes. Because you could have adjusted it. No, the adjustment is more. It's additional data, right? So you need, it, you need it to rewrite this data that you have in a language of two bundles. If you don't adjust, you can't do that. But that's already true at the level of ordinary principle bundles. If you want to rewrite an ordinary principle bundle in that way that I gave before as a two bundle, you can only do that if you adjust your connections. Right. It's just an additional algebraic data that happens to be naturally there for a lot of two groups. Right. And um, you, you need to turn this on, you need to allow this freedom, and then everything is fine and you can do what, what you naturally want to do. Uh, probably a different picture is if, if you look at it from the perspective of um, uh, of the Atia algebraid, right? And you say a connection is just a splitting of the anchor map. You see that you need to, yeah, the appropriate picture there allows for freedom, one freedom that you need to fix. And this freedom is exactly the choice of adjustment. And there's good ways of fixing that, where you get non-fake flat connections, and there's bad ways of fixing that by just saying, okay, it's zero, and then you get just fake flat ones. Fake flat connections are bad, right? This is what leads to the full thing that you know, non-abelian jobs are useless, they're not interesting, we shouldn't look there, that's, that's bad, it's rumor. But once you adjust them, everything falls into place and you have all these descriptions, right? That's it. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so, yeah, so, uh, is EL infinity, is that, is that an opera? Uh, yes, yes. It's a, it's a homotopy algebra for the H. Lee opera. But if you ask me what precisely the H. Lee operator is, I can't give you the full answer, unfortunately, yet. I can give you H. Lee 2, which is exactly what you need for physics. And I don't need, uh, know if you need more than this ever in physics. So, but yeah, it hasn't been written down completely yet. Yeah. And then uh, rather unrelated question, you said you, I believe you claim that every Lee 2 group can be stripped Yes. What's the reference for that? Uh, that's bias counts, right? Uh, bias louder. Ah, for little groups, okay, yeah, I have to look there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, there may be some subtlety there. Yeah. But there's a usual rectification theorem that you would expect, right? So, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The motivation at strings on frames, uh, is it actually, is there mm -hmm. a effect of the actual force? Mm -hmm. Like a frames on frames, what's the effect of the actual force? 
Yeah, this, right? I mean, this action here, if you look at it, um, this is what should describe certain parts of M5 brains, right? The B field is the B field that you would expect on the M5 brain. Um, if you look at the supersymmetry transformation, for example, for this, and you identify BPS states, they're exactly the self-dual strings of M2 brains ending on M5 brains. Ah, uh, okay, so, so no, no, I don't know. Yeah, exactly, yeah, that, that's, that's uh, a question. But I would already be happy with, I mean, I'm already happy with this for now, right? Because people claim that this is impossible, right? There's all kinds of arguments that people say this is impossible. You can't turn on interactions, right? And, but you can do it. Right? So, um, of course, that's not the two-zero theory, right? That's a one-zero theory. Uh, that's a tensor branch of the two-zero theory, where two-zero supersymmetry is broken to one-zero. But for that, you have a classical Lagrangian description. And if you if you put you know what well, what you do is you give this phi and non-zero expectation value because at zero is exactly the two-zero theory. And perturb around this, you have perturbative quantum field theory. Life is good, right? But yeah, I mean, that's probably then beyond that, yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you expect the uh, this uh, jump, uh, you can define uh, the parameters on the scope. Oh, yes, you can. Yes, yes, sorry, I, I, um, um, I didn't talk about this. But you can do adjusted power transfer. So what uh, Conrad and, and uh, was found is in this first paper where they put the fake curvature flat. Uh, you need fake flatness, otherwise the power transport is not really power station invariant. But even in these papers, they already have a functor that doesn't match just the path group point into BG, but the, which gives you the connection, the, the finite form of the connection, but also involving the curvature, right? So you look at the um, you look at B of the inner derivation two group of your group, and then you have. Uh, connection and curvature, the finite form, so to speak. So paths are mapped to um, group elements and surfaces are mapped to um, the elements in this two group of the inner derivation of your gauge group. Okay? This picture has a generalization to higher, and if you then adjust, everything works again. Right? So parallel transport is fine. Yeah. But you, you, need to, you need to adjust and you need to go to this generalized picture. Right? It's no longer that the path groupoid into BG where you just assign for every path a gauge group value, you, you really need to double. But this is a standard thing that you need. You need to do it also in this Atiyah algebra construction if you want to have an Atiyah algebra. Um, you need it also in this adjustment, you know, when, when you dis define this adjusted connections, you can see it as morphisms from the Vey algebra of your Li2 group into the differential forms and so on. So this appears everywhere in high gauge theory that you should no longer work with um, uh, with uh, just, just the ordinary gauge algebra, but with the inner derivation, go to the Bay algebra. Um, and just corresponds to the fact that usually we say a connection is a splitting of the RT algebra sequence of the anchor map, right, as vector bundles. But of course, these vector bundles have the structure of an algebra. If you want to split them as algebra, then you need to look at the Bay picture. And then everything works out as well. You, you need to double, essentially. You need to go to the inner derivations. Then you, can, then you respect the differential structure, right? Um, and, and this is exactly what you have to do in the Atiyah algebra. Now, in the higher picture, you definitely have to do that because the, uh, the ordinary picture just doesn't generalize. You do it in the parallel transport, in the Atiyah group, every, everywhere you replace the ordinary one with a doubled one. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you.